Okay, hello. Um, uh, is there anything I have to announce or anything like that? I don't think so. Other questions? Okay, so I'm just going to start talking about Descartes. Um, Lay the cards to the books. Nine ninety six to nine forty one. Um, and well, I guess I should say, you know, I have to say this in almost every course I teach. I'm not really a historian. <laughs> I mean, I'm not a historian at all. I'm a philosopher. <laughs> so, um, and. Uh, like basically my acquaintance with these people is that I read their books and at first I don't know anything about them <laughs> as people. And then gradually I'm forced to learn one thing after another. <laughs> I know a little bit now, but I'm still not really a historian. <laughs> so, um, uh, you know, fortunately in the case of Descartes, the first reading discourse from the discourse and the method contains the most important facts from his point of view anyway, about his life, right? Um, but I can say a few things about him that are interesting or and or relevant. Um, so he was born in France and he worked partly in France, but he spent a fair amount of his life in other places. Um, first of all, as he mentions, uh, traveling as as a soldier mostly is when he was doing. He was a mercenary. <laughs> um, some say he was a spy. Actually, I don't I don't know how good the evidence for that is. Um, uh, later on, after he you know left the military life, um, uh, he lived on and off in Holland. Right. And so when, you know, when he says in the discourse, I'm writing in this great city where I can be in the midst of a great crowd as if I were in a desert, that that great city is Amsterdam. Um, and uh, why did he live and work partly in Holland? And in, in the discourse, he says he just wanted to get away from the distraction of all the people who knew in France. But uh but presumably it was also because it was a safer place to write potentially uh, um, disturbing philosophy, <laughs> right? And I think if you read this reading from the discourse, you can see how much that's weighing on his mind like, soon after the condemnation of Galileo. Um, I mean, we have to keep that in mind with all three of these people probably more with Descartes than with Spinoza and Leibniz, but they're all thinking about, it. you know, how what they're writing is going to be read and what the consequences might be. Um, anyway, he died in Sweden, where he was invited by Queen, Queen Christina of Sweden to come, like, tutor her and establish an academy and various stuff. Um, some people say that the reason he died not long after he moved to Sweden is because Christina made him get up really early every morning. <laughs> and he was so not a morning person that it killed him. That's probably not true. He probably just got sick and died. But anyway, <laughs> um, uh, the other thing that I want to mention about Descartes um, and this is a little bit may, maybe more idiosyncratic on my part that I'm going to um, introduce these facts right away. So there's a woman, Elena Jantz, so how do we pronounce that as a name? Um, she was a serving woman at the house Descartes lodged in in Amsterdam in 1634. So this is one of his days in Holland. And um, they started a relationship and, his, they, and they had a daughter, Francine. 
Francine Descartes, um, uh, there's Descartes acknowledged her as his daughter and he's listed on a baptismal record or whatever. Um, uh, she was born in 1635. She died when she was five years old in 1640, a scarlet fever. Um, at the time she died, Descartes was arranging to have her educated in France. Um, and um, it, he probably had a pretty serious education in mind. Um, why do I say that? Well, he because his niece, Catherine Descartes, who did survive to adulthood, he um, saw to it that she got a, a good education and she um, became a poet and a philosopher and became well known as a leader of a group of like Cartesian women in the Salon circle in Paris, <laughs> right? So, um, so presumably uh, Descartes, she was, and she was named Francine apparently in, you know, because in honor of France, <laughs> right? Descartes is living in sort of semi-exile in Holland. He names his daughter Francine. Um, uh, and 1640 is the year before the meditations were published. Um, and Helena stayed with Descartes for a few years after, even after this, as Descartes moved around, like before this, when Descartes moved around, Helena and Francine were with him. And after this, Helena stayed with him for a few years. Eventually, in 1644, she married someone else. She married like a, a innkeeper or something, and um, Descartes paid the dowry. <laughs> So it would be really interesting if we could fill in the personal details of what was going on here. But of course we can't, that's, you know, um, it's kind of uh, surprising that we know as much as we do about this. Um, okay, so I'm not gonna say more about Francine now, but I may say more about her later. <laughs> um, uh, There's, besides Prince Queen, Queen Christina of Sweden and Helena Chance and Catherine Descartes, there's also another important woman in Descartes' life. Uh, Helena was the only one who he had a romantic relationship with, or at least a physical one, I mean, <laughs> um, as far as we know. But there's also was Princess Elizabeth. I'm going to mention her again later. Princess Elizabeth of Bohemia, or also sometimes called Princess Elizabeth of the Palatine. <laughs> um, uh, anyway, uh, she was kind of a prince. She was kind of a princess of nothing in particular, but she was a princess. <laughs> um, and uh, he corresponded with her, and the principles of philosophy was dedicated to her. Um, Okay, so that's as much as I'm going to say about Descartes' life. If, are there any questions? If so, I probably don't know the answer, but <laughs> you can always try. A lot of this, not all of this, but a lot of this I know from reading Wikipedia articles, which I which I heartily recommend. <laughs> all right, um, Wikipedia is really an amazing, an amazing thing. It's like a I don't know, amazing achievement of our culture. One of the few positive things to emerge from it. No, I shouldn't say that, that's too easy. All right, anyway, um, all right. So now I'm gonna get on to talking about Descartes' works. Um, I guess I don't even want to say yes. So this is just the chronology, right? So the discourse of the things we're gonna be reading. So the discourse, was published in 1638. So sorry, 1637 in French. Um, meditations 
as I said, were published in 1641 in Latin. They were translated into French uh, in 1647, I guess. So after a while, people could read them in French, but originally they were um, written and published in Latin. Um, in, in fact, uh, uh, all three people were reading in this course wrote mostly in French and Latin. Yeah. Um, for Latin translations in English, are there less kind of uh, like compared to uh, like like German or um, uh, Greek? Greek is a better example. Are there less like words where you're just kind of like, oh, I'm not really sure what this how to translate that. Uh, maybe somewhat, but uh, French a lot less, I think. Okay. Right, French and English are kind of tied to each other, you know, for historical and geographical reasons or whatever. So, and even so, actually, I don't really know French, but most of the time I can tell exact, you know, I can look in the French and see exactly word for word, you know, Latin. Yeah, I mean, obviously, a lot of philosophical terminology in English is just Latin, right? So usually the best course, at least I think, is to translate Latin using the same word in English if you possibly can, um, even though sometimes that could be a little bit misleading if you're not used to it. Yeah. Um, but... Um, yeah, I don't know. It's still, it's not, it's not easy to translate philosophy from any language to any language. There's always problems. Um, all right. Uh, what else was I going to say? Oh, and I was going to mention the principles of philosophy. So most of our, almost all of our reading is from the discourse the, today, from the discourse on the method, and the rest is almost all the meditations, but I decided a few readings from the Principles of Philosophy, which is 1644. Um, um, Passions of the Soul, I think I had to cut out this year because of the Monday-Wednesday schedule and the two Monday holidays. <laughs> So, uh, in other years, I've assigned some readings from the Passions of the Soul, but if I'm not mistaken, I took those off. Anyway, that was published in 1649. Um, um, before all of these, he was working on some on a book that he called The World. Um, and that's the one that he mentions in the discourse that he was about to print it. And then he heard of the condemnation of Galileo and he changed his mind. <laughs> right. So that that work was, you know, was supposed to be work of physics and astronomy and everything. And presumably he when he heard that Galileo had been condemned, he was worried that some things in his book would also be condemned that he didn't publish it. Now, I mean, you know, being in Holland, it's not like he was afraid uh, that he was going to be burned at the stake, like Giornato Bruno, or or like put in prison like Galileo. Uh, but he considered himself a good Catholic, apparently. And anyway, he didn't want his works to be like banned. <laughs> um, so, um, yeah, so that's what he was worried about. And as I said, you can hear that worry in the discourse as well. He's so careful to talk about, you know. Uh, whether he wants other people to follow his example or not, for example. <laughs> um, all right. Um, so that's just in general about I mean, these aren't the only things Descartes wrote. There's also geometry and other stuff. Um, uh, but that's just in general about Descartes' works. And now I'm going to start talking about this reading. Again, unless there are questions before I go on. Okay. 
So, I mean, there's really three things that I that I especially want to get out of this room. Um, um, I saw this um, so the first one is radical doubt. Um, how to get it and what it's for. We'll see that the meditations begins with radical doubt, basically. Or like after the first few words of the meditations. So the discourse talking about how to how and why to get to that point is like expanding those first few words of the first meditation into a whole discourse. <laughs> um, so that's one thing. The second thing is the relationship between theory and practice. Right, and remember, I discussed this a little bit in the first lecture, what these words mean. I'll, I'll come back to it again when I talk about it now. And the third one is authority. Um, so we've seen something about philosophical authority and it like acted out in the Aristotelian tradition. But um, uh, Descartes <clears throat> is explicitly discussing the issue of philosophical authority. Some of the medieval people talk about it too in a, in a, in a kind of indirect way, but you have to, <laughs> it's, uh, you have to do some work to, to realize that they're talking about it. Descartes is like explicitly raising the issue. Um, okay, so all three of these things are related to each other. So radical doubt, like, so roughly speaking, what do I mean by this? And it's like, not like I invented the, the expression, but anyway, what do, what do I mean by it when I'm saying it? Um, well, you know, so there's ordinary doubt, right? So ordinary doubt is like, from time to time I've been wrong, so it's best to be cautious. Um, and, you know, I mean, we all do that, basically. I'm more about some things than about others. <laughs> um, whereas radical doubt means I'm going to look for reasons to doubt all of my former opinions. <laughs> right? I'm going to try to cast everything that I used to believe into doubt. Um, now, I mean, this, this is not a quick process, according to Descartes. That's, I mean, I think that's, that's something that's really important to notice in this reading. It's not like Descartes doesn't say, um, oh, one day I decided to doubt all my opinions. <laughs> and then the next, next day I, you know, Right. So first of all, all those years in school and traveling, I guess when I described the facts of his life, I didn't mention what he mentions in the discourse, that he studied in one of the best schools in Europe. <laughs> right. Um, so, uh, right, all those years in school and then all those years traveling, um, all those like were devoted to building up his ordinary doubt, basically. <laughs> Right? Like, um, oh, I'm not sure I can trust what it says in these books. How am I going to decide which one to believe? But that's not, I'm not going to believe anything. <laughs> right? But so it took study, studying in the best school in Europe and being one of the brighter students, as he's not like uh, too embarrassed to say about himself. Right? It, it took all of that for the ordinary doubt to grow sufficient because, right, otherwise, if he was saying, well, I'm studying in a crap kind of crappy school, maybe that's why I'm not finding the truth in the books that I'm being instructed in, right? Or maybe it's because I'm not the best student. So, like, it, it took a huge amount to get the ordinary doubt to the level it came to. And then... 
Um, he says that he sat down in this in this famous stove heated room. Actually, in the original, it says he sat in a stove, but <laughs> people take that to mean a stove heated room. <laughs> I guess a stove heated room was was unusual because, like, as opposed to heated by a fireplace, the old fashioned way. It's kind of a new thing, maybe. I don't know. <laughs> anyway, so he sat down in this famous stove heated room and, like, resolved to doubt all his old opinions and start. To be from the beginning, but then he waited nine years before he did it. <laughs> what he said, because he had to be ready. <laughs> and then once you get to the first meditation, we'll see. Although it's a very short text, right? It's just like three pages or so. Um, it contains many, many steps. It doesn't just say, "Okay, now I'm ready. I'm, I'm doubting all my op old opinions." Right. It doesn't just say, well, I could doubt anything because I could always ask, well, how do you know that? <laughs> right. He goes through this careful process of trying to find real reasons for doubting all of his old opinions. Um, and the the general method for doing that, I mean, like, how could you do that? Right. Like it might seem impossible because you might think in order to cast doubt on an opinion, I have to oppose it to some, right? I have to like um, have another opinion that shows me that this one is doubtful. And so I won't be able to cast doubt on that one. Or if I do, there has to be another one and it can't be an infinite regress. So there must be something that I'm holding um, steady and not even trying to doubt, but I'm using to judge all the others. But um, so that's why Descartes' general method for generating doubt is finding inconsistency. Right? As he says in the discourse, um, Page number one. Um, but oh, here it is. It's on page twenty-four. Now I don't know whether if you have the e-books, whether the pages are the same. That's been yet yet to be there's, determined. There's no page numbers. There's no page numbers at all. Great. Yeah, I don't. <laughs> it, no. In the in the book, the sections on the, the side of the paragraph. Oh, so that these numbers are there. I don't know. I'm, all I know is the book. Because in this book, the, there are, on the side, there are page numbers. So there's like a kind of standard edition of Descartes from the early there 20th no century. There's nothing. In, numbers. Four page numbers. There's nothing at all on the margin. Yeah, just like, like yeah, it's just a part one, one, two, two three. Oh. oh, are the paragraphs numbered? No. No, not in the, I have the book. Okay, I'm gonna. I think next time I'm gonna go back to telling people to buy the edition. This is a problem. There it's are not, like little like, numbers in the brackets, but they're really hard to find. Yeah. But I think those might be the paragraph numbers. Yeah. Is there like an? That's. It's not. It's not a good. Yeah. Okay. I'm right. sorry. <laughs> this is an experiment and. Um, all right. Well, so I can't. So if you have the print edition, it's on page 24 <laughs> near the top. Um, the, the part I'm going to read now, you don't and just listen to it. It is impossible for more than, sorry. Um, uh, maybe this isn't the one I wanted to read, but it says the same thing. Um, considering how many diverse opinions learned men may maintain on a single question, even though it is impossible for more than one to be true. Right? So, like, the principle that Descartes is going on here is the principle of contradiction, sometimes called the principle of non-contradiction. <laughs> but uh, 
Additionally, it's called the principle of contradiction. You're just supposed to realize, obviously, the principle about contradiction is not to do it, right? So, um, right. So, you know, he's saying, like, uh, if there's two inconsistent answers, they can't both be right. So you can raise a doubt about all your beliefs together if you find that your old beliefs are inconsistent, right? And now, so, you know, your old beliefs contain A and not A. Now, um, um, you know they can't both be right. So you found a reason to doubt both of them. Yeah. Does he ever find like try and doubt that and find that again? Doubt the principle of contradiction? Yeah. No. Oh. Um whether you can or not. Um I mean you can see. If, I hope I hope you can see why someone would think that the principle of contradiction is not really uh, it's a condition of if if you're believing something at all, <laughs> you have it, your your belief has to not contradict itself. I think is 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 one way to think about this, or as that is as Kant puts it, it's a principle of formal logic, where formal means we'll see actually where this comes from in the third meditation. Formal means it has to do with the judgment itself, like without worrying about the thing that it's talking about, without worrying about what it refers to. It's a, a formal defect in the judgment if it's not consistent with itself, and you know. Um, if you don't think that, then like, uh, well, you quickly run into trouble. <laughs> uh, like I say, all right, I'm doubting it. But then maybe I'm also not doubting it. <laughs> right? So, I mean, uh, that obviously is not the end of the story. Not, there's nothing is the end of the story in philosophy, but that's just to make it plausible why he would think that that's not a separate thing that he has to try to call into doubt. I, um, okay, so um, so like assuming that you don't think that this is a principle you have to call into doubt, this gives you a way of casting doubt on your beliefs without appealing to any external standard. And um, um, This is the method that the ancient skeptics used, um, or is one of the main me methods that they used, right? Like the ancient skeptics, like Sextus, Sextus Empiric Empiricus. So, right, skepticism was a school of philosophy in the Hellenistic period, the period that I skipped over between Aristotle and Plotinus. <laughs> skepticism was a was a school of philosophy, and the skeptics thought that you should try to suspend judgment on every question, and you'll be happier. <laughs> Don't believe anything. <laughs> um, so, and again, how can you do that? And the answer was, well, when any question comes before you, you have to produce a proof for the one side and another proof for the other side, and then you can suspend judgments. And that's what their like writings were full of that method. And basically Descartes is applying a version of that same method. Um, although, as he says, he's not like the skeptics because doubt is not the final objective here, right? Doubt is a stepping stone on the way to certainty for Descartes. Um, okay, so that's um, that's like a first pass at what's going on with this one. Um, it's related to this one, authority. Why? Because where do my former opinions come from? <laughs> yeah. 
I am having a little trouble understanding what, what I guess radical doubt is in your kind of definition. Like, I understand that we're like using the principle of contradiction and uh, that he's Descartes using as a stepping stone to like in their knowledge, but I don't think entirely. Is it just like doubt everything? But I don't know. Well, um, it's not exactly doubt everything. It's doubt all of my old opinions. Uh, I mean, um, from my point of view, there's no difference between those two things, right? But but as I, that is, I don't have to find reasons for doubting things that I never believed to begin with. <laughs> um, but yeah, so. Um, that's what it is, but again, the idea is that it takes a lot of work to do that, <laughs> um, right? That you can't achieve that. I mean, uh, you could say, well, I'm just not gonna believe what I used to believe before, but you still do, <laughs> right? Um, so, and in fact, at the end of the first meditation, when Descartes has, or Descartes meditator has succeeded in establishing radical doubt, they say, um, but my old opinions keep coming back and I, right? Like, um, uh, I'm gonna have to take further steps, <laughs> right? So, um, okay, so anyway, I was, did, did that help with what, yeah, okay. So, Right, so my old opinions, where did they come from? Well, um, they came from my senses and appetites, for one thing, um, but they also came from my teachers and partly in-person teachers, like starting with my parents and whatever. But, you know, if you're highly educated like Descartes, a, a lot of your opinions come from books. Or from Wikipedia, a <laughs> more updated version, right? Um, so, uh, so this step, taking this step, is um, means casting doubt on all authorities. And you know, uh, sure enough, when Descartes explains why, I'll, I'll talk, say more about this later, I hope, but when Descartes explains why he didn't just follow what it said in the books that he was taught from, he says, well, I couldn't because they contradicted each other, <laughs> right? That's the general method being used. Um, she says, like, maybe I should have, but I couldn't because I, I knew that they, they didn't all say the same thing. <laughs> um, so that's like the relationship between these two things. But um, this is related to this because, well, for two reasons, basically. Um, um, one is that we need to ask, why do this, <laughs> right? It's this hard task. It almost seems impossible um, uh, to cast doubt on all your old opinions. Why do that? Doesn't even seem like a good idea, right? I mean, a lot of your old opinions maybe were true. <laughs> and now you're gonna cast doubt on all of them. So you're casting doubt on the true ones also. Um, uh, it, it, it sounds like this might be dangerous or something. Um, so that's one way, that, that's one kind of relationship that this has to, or it's one way this project brings out a relationship between theory and practice. This is a theoretical project, right? It's a project of Remember, theory, theoretical questions are questions about what's true and what's false, right? They're questions that have to do with trying to gain knowledge. Practical questions are questions about what I should do. 
So um, this is a theoretical project, right? I'm trying to do something um, to affect what things I believe to be true and not as part of a quest for knowledge. But there's a practical question about whether to do it. Is that the right thing to do? So that's one relationship. But then there's another relationship, which um, comes up because we're reading Descartes. <laughs> and uh, that is because Descartes doesn't just do this inside his head, which is once you reach some conclusion about something, then whether to say that to someone else or not is a practical question. Right? And of course, especially if you're going to have it printed and published, <laughs> it becomes a weightier practical question, but it's always a practical question. So, um, right, so, so like both of these together are why you can, you can never really talk about metaphysics and epistemology, which are the theoretical parts of philosophy, without also thinking about ethics and politics. Um, right, there's number one, there's always going to be a practical question about whether um, your search for truth and knowledge is a good thing to do. <laughs> um, and there's um, always going to be a question afterwards whether you should report what you found or not. Um, Okay, so how does Descartes answer? I mean, I pretty much already said that, but um, but now I'm going to read where Descartes says it. Um, what's Descartes' answer for why do this? Why is this a good thing to do? Well, um, at the beginning of the meditations, um, so this is, we haven't read this yet, but beginning of the first meditation, I already read it. <laughs> I, I mean, I already read it a long time. All right, so I, I know it's coming. All right, so, um, uh, I realized that it was necessary once in the course of my life to demolish everything completely and start again right from the foundations if I wanted to establish anything all in this at all in the sciences that was stable and likely to last. So that's why we're doing this, right? So again, the, the radical doubt is a step on the way to certainty. The reason he's doing it is because he wants to establish something certain and permanent in the sciences. Um, And he says similar things in the discourse and also at the very beginning of the principles, right? So, so in other words, although Descartes uses a skeptical method, he's not, a, at least as he understands it, he's not a skeptic. Um, Okay, um, so we want to establish something certain. Why do we want to establish something certain? I mean, you know, like, because most of the time we do pretty well not being certain. Um, why is it so important to establish something certain? And how important is it? Well, so in this translation, and this is a thing, I mean, remember I, I said about philosophy translations in the first time that there's a limit to how good they can be, but most of them don't get very close to the limit. 
<laughs> so in other words, their uh, they, the philosophy translations can only be so good, but most of them are much less good than that, right? So here's something, I don't understand why they did this. So <laughs> like, this is on page 31, it's near the, near the very end of part two of the discourse. Descartes says, um, I thought that first of all, I had to try to establish some certain principles in philosophy. He explains why, like if he wanted to establish anything certain in the other sciences, he would have to start with philosophy, right? So I thought that first of all, I had to try to establish some certain principles in philosophy. And the translation says, since this is the most important task of all, but what it actually says in the original word for word is, since this is the most important thing in the world, <laughs> Right, and again, like you don't have to know friends, like la chose du monde la plus importante, <laughs> right? The thing in the world that is most important, the most, or as we would say in English, the most important thing in the world. Since this is the most important thing in the world, why is it the most important thing in the world? <laughs> well, so one thing he says is. Um, oh, here we go. This is on page, this is like just a little bit before what I was reading before. So it's near the bottom of page 24, still near the end of part two. It was always my most earnest desire to learn to distinguish the true from the false in order to see clearly into my own actions and proceed with confidence in this life. Um, says something similar at the top of page 34. This is towards the end of part three. He says, I was following a path by which I thought I was sure to acquire all the knowledge of which I was capable, and in this way, all the true goods within my reach. Right? So here's, I mean, uh, it's not another relationship between theory and practice, but it's an answer to the first one, right? So I was saying, like, why do this? So, I mean, you like, you can imagine various answers like, well, uh, you know, because I'm being paid to teach geometry and uh, like, students won't be happy if the my demonstrations don't make them certain. <laughs> Right. So that would be like a practical reason for, for trying to achieve certainty, but it's um, not like a kind of ultimate practical reason. Right. It's what Kant would call a hypothetical imperative. Right. It's like, so, okay, do achieve certainty if you want your students to like their geometry class. <laughs> but if you don't care if your students like their geometry class, then you don't have to reach certainty. Right. But um, uh, so like many practical questions are not directly ethical questions, right? When I ask, what should I do? Most of the time, I, you know, I'm taking it for granted that I want something and I'm asking what to do to get it. But I'm not asking whether I should want that, <laughs> right? But Descartes is saying that, um, I mean, the first passage I read from part two could sound kind of like the geometry class example, like a hypothetical imperative, um, right? That I wanted to see clearly into my own actions and proceed with confidence in this life, right? So you might think, well, he wants to become rich and famous and whatever, right? So he's hoping that if he becomes certain about something, that will help him with those objectives. Um, but I think from the second passage I read, from part three, and in this way, right, to acquire all the knowledge of which I was capable, and in this way, all the true goods within my reach, he's saying that um, he needs certainty in order to know which things he should desire, which things are true goods within his reach. So that means both 
distinguishing between true goods and false goods, apparent goods, right? And distinguishing between achievable goods and impossible goods. So as to limit your desire to the ones that are really good and really within your control. Um, and um, um, so, right, so that's giving, I think, what Kant would call a categorical practical response to this question. Why do it? It's like, um, it's your duty to be certain about what is a true good and what isn't, <laughs> right? Or it's um, uh, like, by definition of good or something like that, it's desirable to be certain what are true goods within your reach and what are not. I mean, there is an assumption here, right? I think the assumption is something like, if you know something is a good, true good within your reach, then you'll do the right things to achieve it. Um, or at least then you're more likely to do the right things to achieve it. Um, and right, that's kind of a Socratic assumption about virtue and Descartes endorses it explicitly. Um, Um, so in particular, like the, um, um, the results, the certainty that results from this radical doubt, if it's really useful, um, in the end is going to, to turn out not just to establish something certain in physics, although Descartes is really interested in that, <laughs> okay? Um, but, uh, but also it's supposed to, in the end, uh, possibly overturn your practical, that is your ethical opinions. Um, so here's some things from the, from the correspondence between Descartes and Elizabeth. Elizabeth, right, I mentioned she was a princess. And I say she was sort of the princess of nothing. Her father was like the Elector Palatine, which is the kind of ruler of a portion of the Holy Roman Empire. But then he was deposed from that position, or like the you know, and then he was king of Bohemia for a while. But then he was deposed from that position, and so they were a sort of royal family floating around. <laughs> um, anyway, uh, so uh, um, and yes, yeah, sixteen sixty seven to. Uh, 1680. Um, wait, that can't be right. 1667. 1607? This is after Descartes died. <laughs> well, she would have been only 13 years old. All right, I copied this down from wrong from Wikipedia. Uh, <laughs> you can look it up yourself if you want to know what year she was oh, born. Yeah. 1618 to 1680, according to Wikipedia. <laughs> okay, where did 1667? All right, anyway. Okay. I, I mean, Wikipedia is not 100% reliable, but. Um, Oh, uh, also according to the Stanford Encyclopedia of right. Philosophy. But so I mean, but you know, the 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 secret is that, we sh that maybe I shouldn't let out is that peer-reviewed published articles are also not 100 percent reliable. <laughs> so um Wikipedia is pretty accurate. Um and 
unlike the Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy, it's not written by someone who has an ax to grind in the questions that are being discussed. <laughs> Right. In fact, there's a policy, right? NP, <laughs> or right. So, or NPLV, or I don't know. Anyway, right. So, uh, whatever. They're they're different resources. They're good for different things. But, oh, um, okay. Sorry. So, getting back to what Descartes and Elizabeth. Well, I guess I should say one thing. So, Elizabeth and Descartes' uh, correspondence is most famous for their art for Elizabeth's question about the relationship between the soul and the body. And actually, in courses like this, a lot of times these days that's assigned. Maybe I should assign it. I don't want to rearrange my whole course. <laughs> But there's other interesting things there, correspondence. So I'm just going to read a little bit from it here. So Elizabeth asks at some point, this is in 1645, um, about whether it would be better to overestimate the goods that one has and not consider those one lacks. Quote, or to have more consideration and knowledge in order to know the just value of the one and the other and to become sadder, <laughs> right? So she's saying like, th this, is, this is a potential criticism of, of what I was just saying about the relationship between knowledge and good and whatever, right? Saying that um, knowing what are true goods and what are not is, um, gonna like, for example, like if I'm a princess <laughs> and I grow up thinking being a princess is really great. But then I study philosophy and I realize that actually being a princess is not a true good. Now I'm sadder, <laughs> right? So Elizabeth is saying, you know, is, I mean, the truth is, I think Elizabeth is really is on Descartes' side. That is, like, wants that the answer Descartes is going to give. But I mean, she, this is a, it's a good question for a princess to raise, <laughs> right? Right. So, so Descartes answers, um, if I were to think, this is the beginning of his answer. It's a long answer. If I were to think that the sovereign good consisted of joy. Right, that's the beginning of his answer. So in other words, he's saying like that, that apparent criticism takes something for granted, namely that it's better to be happy than sad. And Descartes is like, begins by saying, if I were to think that then, right? But he doesn't think that, yeah. Do you think the principle of constitution here where he even phrase the three or the point if it was true and then one first is not? No, because he's not trying to cast doubt here. He's trying to right. That's 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 specific. That's a skeptical method for 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 bringing about doubts. Um. Okay, and this is uh, later in the same letter. I distinguish between the sovereign. It's not that much later. I distinguish between the sovereign good, which consists in the exercise of virtue or what is the same thing, in the possession of all the goods whose acquisition depends on our free will, and the satisfaction of mind which follows this acquisition. Right, so the sovereign good is, attain, is the exercise of virtue, that is the possession of all the goods whose acquisition depends on our free will. Of course, if you get that and you and you wanted it because you knew you should try to get it, then you'll feel a certain satisfaction or happiness because of that. But Descartes is saying he distinguishes between those two things. This is why seeing that it is a greater perfection to know the truth, even though it is our disadvantage than not to know it, I admit that it would be better to be less gay and to have more knowledge. Right, so um, it's showing how far this kind of radical doubt about practical opinions can take you. He's, Descartes is concluding that um, 
it's again, it's a Socratic result from a Socratic um, assumption. Like it turns out that the true good is knowledge, really. <laughs> right? Like, um, um, because the one thing that you always need is knowledge of what is a true good and what is. <laughs> All right. Um, by the way, do I have time for this? Yeah, why not? I'm going to re also read something, part of uh, the dedication of the principles to Elizabeth, because apparently th that unfortunately was left out in this book. It starts with the beginning of the principles and left, leaves out the dedication. So first of all, you should know that dedications, like if you read books from the 17th, 18th century, they, they at least the early 18th century, they begin with dedications to like nobles usually or always, really. <laughs> they begin with dedications to nobles, and the dedications are full of like crazy, exaggerated praise and like humility, <laughs> right? Like, I am your humble servant and blah, 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 blah. So uh, Descartes begins his dedication by saying, well, it doesn't become a philosopher to do that. So I'm just going to say things that are true. <laughs> um, um, and uh, later on, towards the end, explaining why it's Elizabeth that he's dedicating the principles to. He says, um, I have never yet met anyone who understood so generally and so well as yourself all this that, that is contained in my writings. For there are several, even among men of the highest intellect and learning, who find them very obscure. And I remark in almost all those who are conversant in metaphysics that they are wholly disinclined from geometry, and on the other hand, that the cultivators of geometry have no ability for the in investigations of the first philosophy, insomuch that I can say with truth that I, I know but one mind, and that is your own, to which both studies are alike congenial, and which I therefore with propriety designate incomparable. <laughs> right? So, I mean, that is like flattery, basically, but apparently, I, I think, but it's not... Um, it's so it's it's so specific, right? You're the one person I know, right? Like, not your lordship with your lordship's grace and blah 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 blah, right? But just you, Elizabeth, are the one person I know who understands both metaphysics and geometry. <laughs> um, uh, all right, that was just kind of a side point, but I wanted to read that. Um, um. Okay, but now there seems to be a kind of chicken and egg problem here because uh, I have to decide what to do, right? Here I am in the stove heated room. I have to decide what to do. Um, in order to decide what to do, I have to cast doubt on all my old opinions. And, th and that's going to take years. <laughs> and then I'm going to have to painstakingly build up new opinions that are certain. And at the end of that, I'm going to know what are the true goods and what I, sh you know, that are within my reach and what I should do to get them. Um, but uh, so how am I supposed to decide now what to do? <laughs> right? Um, so the solution to this sort of is what Descartes calls his provisional morality, right? That, that, that he announces at the beginning of part three of the discourse. He, he said, right, he says basically, right, he compares this project to tearing down your old house in order to build a new one. And he says, Oh, but you shouldn't do that until you find a place to live in between. 
we're planning to remodel our house this summer. So this is kind of <laughs> too close to, for comfort. But anyway, um, right. So, okay, well, that, I mean, that kind of makes sense, but where are we going to get that from? That provisional morality and also how is isn't isn't there going to be a problem because as we go through this process of radical of getting to radical doubt we're going to start to undermine that provisional morality right it, like it's one thing to talk about tearing down one house while you live in another but here we're talking about tearing down all your old opinions so isn't it going to get any house that you build no matter where you put it um Um, so one of the rules of the provisional morality, and I think this helps both in seeing where it comes from and how it can withstand the project of doubt for as long as it needs to, is, um, this is the third maxim. So it's, it's on page 32 near the bottom. Um, no, sorry, that's the second maxim is what I read. Th page 32 in the middle. My second maxim was to be as firm and decisive in my actions as I could and to follow even the most doubtful opinions once I had adopted them with no less constancy than if they had been quite certain. Right, so it turns out the provision part of the provisional morality is to adopt the exact opposite rule for cases of practice as I am for cases of theory. Right, so the, in the case of theory, my rule is going to be that I reject anything that I can find even the slightest reason for doubting. And in that way, if eventually I find at least slight reasons for doubting everything, I will have completed the project. But in, so, so that's what I'm doing in the case of theory. But in the case of practice, it's the exact opposite, right? Descartes says that he's going to um, act on even the most doubtful opinions just as if they were completely certain. And he explains why you should do that. That is, right, why is theory different from practice? Um, using this example of, of a traveler who's lost in a forest. It says, a traveler who, upon finding himself lost in a forest, should not wander about turning this way and that, and still less stay in one place. Now, if you're really lost in a forest, you're supposed to stay in one place. That's what they tell you now, right? But that's on the assumption that someone's looking for you. Right? That's also why you're supposed to let someone know before you go into the forest, right? But suppose no one is looking for you and you're and you're and you're lost in a forest. Then obviously staying in one place is a bad idea because then you're going to remain in the middle of the forest. <laughs> right. So the 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 traveler um shouldn't turn this way and that and still less stay in one place, but should keep walking as straight as he can in one direction, never changing it for slight reasons, even if mere chance made him choose it in the first place. Right. So like, of course, if I can find some reason to favor one direction over another, however slight, I should use that. And then I should keep going straight in that direction as much as I can. Obviously, I might come to a huge chasm or something and I won't be able to keep going straight. But as much as I can, I should keep going straight because if I start turning this way and that way, I'm going to end up going in circles and I won't get out of the forest. Right. But and even if I can't find any reason to choose one direction over another, I should choose a direction <laughs> and follow that because it's going to be better than staying in the middle of the forest. <laughs> um, right, as he says, um, for in this way, even if he does not go exactly where he wishes, he will at least end up in a place where he is likely to be better off than in the middle of a forest. <laughs> Um, um, and the first maxim, that was the second maxim. The first maxim, I think, is really a correlate of the second maxim. 
The first maxim is to obey the laws and customs of my country, holding constantly to the religion in which by God's grace I had been instructed from my childhood. This um, um, I think you can put a lot of weight on that sentence, actually. The religion in which by God's grace I had been instructed from my childhood. Um, like, what does that mean about grace? Well, you know, it means it's just an accident that I have this religion rather than some other religion. <laughs> I didn't do anything to deserve it. Like, how could I have before I was born, right? So, um, so it's by God's grace. I mean, that is one way of understanding that would be by God's grace, I'm a Catholic and I was educated by Jesuits, which was, you know, and, you know, whatever. And so I'm much better off than all those other people. But another way of reading it is no matter where you're born and what religion you're instructed in, you're going to say the same thing. By God's grace, I was right. So, um, and that's, I mean, that clearly applies to the first part, to obey the laws and customs of my country, right? I mean, remember all the things he said about traveling to different countries and how good that is, because you see that the things that look ridiculous to us are considered perfectly reasonable in another country. And therefore, you start to realize that, the, that we're not so sure about the things we think are reasonable. Right. So, um, so clearly, you know, Descartes could could propose this same provisional mor morality to someone who's born in China. They would stick to different customs and a different religion, but they would still be adopting the same principle. And the reason why I say it's it's a corollary of the second maxim is because it like why why keep up with the same customs you've been instructed in? Well, don't turn aside for slight reasons. Keep going straight. You'll like you'll you'll likely end up somewhere better than the middle of the forest, <laughs> right? So um, so the plan seems to be um, what's this? It'd be nice if I could use all of this blackboard, but I think for that I would need like a camera. So, um, I've been watching some math lectures on YouTube from like Harvard Extension, and they did have a camera person to follow me. <laughs> All right. Anyway, sorry. Um, so, so there's like step A is adopt the provisional morality. I mean, there's more to it than the, than the little parts that I read, but I think those, the third maxim is important too, but, um, but anyway, so there's this provisional of morality that we first adopt. And, the, the, and we adopt it means we're going to treat it as perfectly certain, even though it's not perfectly certain, because the rule in practice is to treat your opinions, no matter how doubtful, as if they were perfectly certain. And then once the, the provisional morality is, um, is in place, we proceed to the project of radical doubt in theory, right? And by in theory here, I mean, again, like about theoretical questions. It doesn't mean what we usually mean by in theory. Right, like this doesn't mean what we ordinarily mean by the distinction between theory and practice. Kant actually wrote a whole like essay about how people misuse this terminology and they shouldn't. <laughs> so it, um, it means the difference between a situation where I'm asking what I should believe and a situation where I'm asking what I should do. So, right, so with this in, in place to keep the practical side nailed down, I then go to the theoretical side 
and I carry out the project of radical doubt. And then Hopefully, the idea, the plan here, that once I've carried out this radical doubt, I'll then find a new certain foundation from which to, to build up beliefs again. It might be, as Descartes says, it might be some of the same beliefs that I had before. It might be different beliefs, but even if it's the same, now they'll be certain, whereas before they weren't. And then finally, We're going to get the practical results, which is knowing the true good that's within my reach and how to achieve it. Right? And then the idea would be, okay, so at that point, that's why this is provisional. <laughs> at that point, I can ditch the provisional morality and get the true morality. However, there's kind of a complication to this which is um, that there seems to be a different reason given for why practice and theory are not the same situation. So like, why don't we pull down all the houses in a city? <laughs> um, Right, so right, he raises this question on page 26. This is in, you know, I don't know, second paragraph of part two. The first paragraph is long. Well, I mean, I guess he, in the first paragraph, he makes the point he, or claim that things that are done by one person are usually better than things that are done by a committee. Right, because there's one plan that everything conforms to. And one example of that, he, as one example of that, he says, you know, cities that have just grown up from being a village to being a big city, like one building at a time, are usually not that well planned out. Like uh, Boston is an excellent example of the city. <laughs> uh, when I used to live in Boston, well, this was before, you guys can't understand this probably. <laughs> this is before Google Maps or anything like that. So you're just like on your own. And when I would get lost, which often happens, my rule would be not to try to turn around and get back to where I was before, but just to keep going until I got to a place that I recognize. And that always happens because eventually you go in a big circle. <laughs> you just randomly turn. All right. Anyway, sorry. That's... Um, uh, some people like my digressions and some people hate them. <laughs> I like them. But... All right. Um, anyway, so right. So so he says, you know, and this is part. This is part of explaining why the best thing to do. I mean, you might think we should kind of do this together, like we should all like doubt each other's opinions or something. But he, he's like, no, this is something I have to sit down and do for myself. Um, but then, so then you might say, well, hold on a second, Descartes. That like analogy you just gave isn't very promising, right? Because although maybe it's true, maybe it's true. I think Wittgenstein disagrees with this, actually. He uses a similar example of a city. <laughs> But uh, but maybe it's true that a city that's been planned out in advance by a city planner, like Washington, D.C. or whatever, right, where you knew in advance where all the streets were going to be, that that's a better city <laughs> than Boston. Um, but nevertheless, right, and this is where this paragraph begins, Admittedly, we never see people pulling down all the houses of a city for the sole purpose of rebuilding them in a different style to make the streets more attractive. I guess actually, you know, it's weird. He's not so worried about that it's hard to get around this city. He's just worried that the buildings don't match each other. <laughs> okay, well, whatever. <laughs> in any case, 
So um, we don't see people tearing down the whole city and rebuilding it according to a single plan, even though that would be better if they had done that to begin with. And isn't there a good reason for that? <laughs> um, so, um, Descartes says this is where the this is where pulling down your house comes in because he says, um, well, okay, it's true we don't do that with cities, but you do see people do that with their house, remodel their house. Like I said, we're thinking about doing that if we can afford it. All right, so, um, uh, so Descartes says. This example convinced me that it would be unreasonable for an individual to plan to reform a state by changing it from the foundations up and overturning it in order to set it up again. Or again, for him to plan to reform the body of the sciences or the established order of teaching them in the schools. But regarding the opinions to which I had hitherto given credence, I thought I could not do better than to under undertake to get rid of them all at one go. So, like, it appears that the distinction he's making here is between private and public, right? So, like, um, in a public case, we don't uh, tear down everything and restart. Why? Why would that be unreasonable? Well, I mean, it would be a lot of trouble is one reason. But another reason that he's not saying and that... Uh, you might not want to say if you want your work to be published in France in the 17th century is that maybe it's unreasonable to give any one person so much power that they can tear down everyone's house and rebuild it from the beginning, right? Maybe that's a bad idea. <laughs> um, so, uh, um, so, you know, I mean, of course, Descartes turns it in the opposite direction to make himself sound safe rather than dangerous, right? He says, and therefore, of course, far be it from me to plan to reform the state or even the university, <laughs> right? I'm just worried about my own private opinions. I mean, the latter part, I think we know from his life is not serious. Like he did, he tried to get his students placed in universities and, and like, you know, um disseminate his views <laughs> um the former part is harder to say but um um in any case you could look at it either way uh this that distinction between private and public but i mean of course even in private life there's times when it would be inconvenient for me to like um, tear down my house, change the way, change my customs, change the way I, you know, change my religion even. Um, there are times when that would be inconvenient to everyone around me. Right, like there isn't a, a there isn't a firm line between like if I tear down my house, it might knock your house over. <laughs> um, and similarly, like if I change the way I act, I might disrupt the society that you depend on. Right, so like I don't. In order to bring down these, right, as Descartes says, these huge bodies like states and religions and universities. When they fall, they fall hard and they do a lot of damage. And it's hard to rebuild them. <laughs> um, so uh, um, there's things a private individual can do, probably, that would also have that consequence. Right. So, like, it seems like um, the real line. Um, maybe is it's really between changing my opinions and changing my practice. If I just change my opinions, but I keep acting according to the customs of my country, I'm not going to disrupt anything. 
I think that's what Descartes is thinking. Um, one reason to think, I mean, of course, unless I'm really living in the midst of a remote desert. <laughs> um, but, you know, Descartes is as if in the middle of a remote desert. He's not really in a remote desert. And even if he were in a remote desert, he's not really because we're reading it. <laughs> right? It got to us somehow. Like, this is going to be really important to keep in mind in reading the meditations, because the, the meditations a, appear to occur when someone is alone in a room talking to themselves, right? In fact, the meditator says part of the preparations for doing this was um, um, solius sesedo, I like that. Um, secede, right, by myself, <laughs> right? Like I um, go away by myself separately. But they're not, that's like a fiction. Descartes isn't really alone in a room. Descartes is talking to us. <laughs> All right. Anyway, uh, getting back to what it says in the discourse. So one reason to think that this is a way of understanding it is what he says at the beginning of part six. Right, and that's, this is why I, re I assigned just this very first part of part six. It is now three years since I reached the end of the treatise that contains all these things. That's the one that was going to be called The World. I was beginning to revise it in order to put it in the hands of a publisher when I learned, and this is the key part for our purposes, that some persons to whom I defer and who have hardly less authority over my actions than my own reason has over my thoughts had disapproved of a physical theory published a little while before by someone else, right? And as the footnote tells you, remember these footnotes are not Descartes, right? Footnotes were, I don't know exactly when they were invented, but after Descartes, <laughs> right? So as the footnote tells you, he's alluding to Galileo. Um, and right, so what he's saying is, those persons don't have authority over my opinions. No one but me can have authority over my opinions. I'm responsible for them. And therefore, it's both harmless and necessary for me to tear them down and rebuild them from the beginning. But those persons, that is the Inquisition, <laughs> basically, um, have hardly less authority. That hardly less is, is important, maybe, and I don't know exactly how to understand it. What's the less? <laughs> but anyway, those persons have hardly less authority over my actions than my own reason has over my thoughts. In practice, there is authority. And, in, and we need authority in practice um, and again, there's two ways of looking at it. We need authority in practice because we can't have every troublemaker going and trying to reform the state. Or we need authority in practice because um, we can't have the absolute monarch deciding to change the state. <laughs> um, Okay, and then, and of course, like the reason this this ties it back to the other relation between theory and practice that I was talking about. So those people, the Inquisition, have no authority about what he should think. So if Galileo's right and Descartes thinks he's right, I mean he doesn't say that here for obvious reasons, but Descartes thinks Galileo is right. If Galileo is right, then. Uh, and it's demonstrable that he's right, then uh, um, no one can tell him to believe something else. Like, it isn't even really possible for him to believe something else. <laughs> he has a demonstration. Right? Um, but someone can tell him not to publish it. 
Because that is an action. That's not an opinion. Um, so like one reason I'm, why am I harping on this? Well, I mean, first of all, it's just really important, <laughs> right? That this is, you know, I mean, because like somehow the, the question of authority and in what cases does it make sense for there to be authority and what cases does it not make sense is that like the question that's being raised everywhere in the transition from the Middle Ages to the modern, to the modern world, right? So, um, um, so what exactly Descartes thinks about it is important. But I mean, it's also important for this course because as I understand it, we're gonna see Leibniz saying that Descartes has missed something, that it's not true that it's, that it's harmless to do this with your opinions. Um, okay. Um, so, I mean, there's a lot of things in the discourse, as I said, that are related to this issue. And I mean, how does Descartes feel about this? It's hard to tell because this can, like this, have to do like centrally with the exact things that it would be dangerous to say. <laughs> so we're not sure whether like so the expert the official explanation, even that, as I said, is ambiguous. But somehow it would be dangerous for him to say these things, and therefore he's not going to say them. Dangerous to who? Dangerous to, to society. Right, like it's necessary for him to defer to the authorities because it's um, uh, like from one point of view or the other, it's not good to try to pull down these great bodies like the state and whatever and rebuild them from the beginning. So um, um, on the other hand, you might imagine him, so you can imagine him being since completely sincere about it, having certain opinions and not, but not publish them because he thinks it would be disruptive to society to publish them. Or on the other hand, you can imagine him thinking mostly about the danger to himself <laughs> and thinking, boy, I would love to disrupt society, but I'm gonna get killed if I do it. So I'm gonna keep it to myself. Um, and, you know, I mean, it's it's very hard to tell the difference between these two things always go together somehow. And that, like philosophers are always worried about, I think, in one way or another, right? Again, like it's not, it doesn't have to be that you're going to be burnt at the stake. <laughs> it could be that, you're, that your writings are going to be somehow affected, right? I mean, we have this now too, right? Like some of it can be, canceled, for example, right? I mean, there's different ways of being canceled. Uh, well, uh, a lot of people are worried about being canceled by the left, but of course, as the president of Harvard University found out, the right is better at it. Right? <laughs> okay, but anyway, never mind that. Uh, so there's different, there's dangers like that to worry about, but they like they go together with, is that really what someone's worried about? Or are they worried that, you know, I really, this shouldn't say this, right? There's certain questions that shouldn't be addressed. Um, even if no one was going to cancel me for addressing them. All right. So, and, but obviously, like if you're Thomas Aquinas, you're worried about a lot about being canceled in a much more serious sense, right? <laughs> like condemned as a heretic, you know, whatever. Um, because Thomas Aquinas was not a saint and a doctor of the church in his lifetime, he was a controversial Aristotelian. Uh, theologian who a lot of people looked at this stuff very suspiciously. <laughs> um, he had to be very careful. All right. Anyway, um, getting back to Descartes. So, you know, there's a lot of things in here that um, 
it's not clear how to read out Descartes' true opinion on them. Now, I mean, um, I'm not going to go through all of, like all of these things, but there is one that I want to talk about. Um, and it's about the relationship between um, I guess, again, remember, Descartes explains why um, that how he got to this point, in part by saying that I went to one of the best schools in Europe and I wasn't considered to be one of the worst students there or whatever, right? So, um, in other words, it's like he comes from a kind of elitist perspective, is what it sounds like. Maybe not everyone should do this. Um, and he seems at some point to say that, yeah, not everyone should do it, right? So this comes as part of one of his many denials that he should be, people should take him as an example for what to do. Um, and he says, you know, my plan has never gone beyond trying to reform my own thoughts and construct upon them a foundation which is all my own. Um, the simple resolution to abandon all the opinions one has hitherto accepted is not an example that everyone ought to follow. The world is largely composed of two types of minds for whom it is quite unsuitable. First, there are those who believing themselves cleverer than they are, cannot avoid precipitate judgments and never have the patience to direct all their thoughts in an orderly manner. Consequently, if they once took the liberty of doubting the principles they accepted and of straying from the common path, they could never stick to the track that must be taken as a shortcut and they would remain lost all their lives. Right? So, I mean, this sounds reasonable enough, but that if, if, uh, if your mind is such that you can't keep consistently on one path, then you shouldn't try this whole project. You'll just end up wandering around. Um, the only problem is, as advice, this is not very useful, right? Because if you are one of those people, then you don't think you are, right? Because these are people who think they're cleverer than they are. <laughs> So it's like, I mean, it's kind of a disclaimer by way of, I don't know what, it's not, it's in a sense, it's not a very good disclaimer. It's kind of like Socrates saying, like, I didn't mean to corrupt the youth. They just followed me around and listened to what I was saying. But okay, I mean, why were you saying things that if they listened to, right, you know? <laughs> so, uh, I mean, but anyway, that's one type. Secondly, there are those who have enough reason or modesty to recognize that they are less capable of distinguishing the true from the false than certain others by whom they can be taught. Such people should be content to follow the opinions of these others rather than seek better opinions themselves. Okay, so now it sounds like he's saying, look, if you're one of the many and you didn't go to the best school in Europe or you don't have one of the best minds or whatever, you should just listen to what someone else says. Don't try to follow my example. But the problem is what he says at the beginning of the next paragraph. For myself, I would undoubtedly have been counted among the latter if I had had only one teacher or if I had never known the differences that have always existed among the opinions of the most learned. Right, so that's the part, as I was saying before, he says, you know, I wish I could have followed other people's opinions, but I found I couldn't because there's no set, consistent set of opinions for me to follow. Well, like if you're reading this and you understand it and you follow what he's saying at that point, he's landed you in the same dilemma he's in. Right, so again, this is useless as advice because he just told you even if you didn't go to the best college in Europe and whatever, Descartes did, and he's telling you, 
The learned don't agree about anything. There's nothing so ridiculous. This is actually, I, I believe, is a, is a quote from Cicero. I don't think Descartes said it first, but like, there's nothing so ridiculous that no, that that some philosopher hasn't argued for it, <laughs> right? So, uh, um, so now you know that. Now you can't do just as he said, right? He says, "I would have been counted among the latter, but I can't. I couldn't because I found out." Well, he just told you. <laughs> Right, so like the sense in which this, it's still elitist in a way, but the, the, the way it makes an elite is by the text itself dividing readers into two parts, right? Like the readers who figure out what he means when he says that and the ones who don't. <laughs> like if you follow what he's saying and you think about it, you'll realize that this advice can't apply to you and you have to reach your own opinion. Have I spoiled it by, by calling your attention to it? Like maybe, maybe I'm corrupting the youth. All right, on that note, <laughs> I'll see you uh, next week. <laughs>